At first, I used to get a little judgmental of myself about it. Like, it has to be this way. And I was so rigid. But it changes, it transforms. It's just like life. Everything is moving. And I think for me, I just felt like I was doing something that was good for my soul, for my mind, for my body. And I wanted to keep doing it because I felt great afterwards. And not that the goal was to feel great, but usually the byproduct is feeling great. Welcome to Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? I'm Emily Fletcher, and I believe that bliss is your birthright. That's why I'm calling on my world-class network to uncover the most potent, spine-tingling, even taboo healing modalities, all so you can reclaim your bliss. Let's do this. I am so delighted to share this conversation with you. Today's guest is one of my new favorite people. He and I met at a friend's birthday party outside of Mexico City, and we were stunned with how much we had in common. We both practiced the same style of meditation. We both studied in Rishikesh, India. We both used to be actors. He is still an actor, happens to be the star of the brand new number one Netflix series called FUBAR, which he stars with with Arnold Schwarzenegger, no big deal. And today we are going to go deep into why isn't everyone training their emotions, something Travis Van Winkle has been doing for the past 20 years. He talks about how doing some of these exercises, these emotional training exercises changed his relationship with his sister and indelibly changed his relationship with his father. So no, emotional training does not just have to be for actors. It's actually something that all of us can do. So I am so excited to share this wide ranging, deep conversation with you. I know you're going to fall in love with Travis the way that I have. And if you go to zivameditation.com slash why this, not only are you going to find amazing bonus content, mini masterclasses from these amazing guests, but you can also see a photo of our special guest star, Travis's dog, Karen, who sat on my lap for about 90% of this episode. So enjoy. And if you love it, I would be so grateful if you will share this episode with your friends, give us a five-star rating and let us know what you think in the comments. Please join me in welcoming the amazing, the kind, the resplendent Travis Van Winkle to the show. Hi, Travis. I'm so happy to have you here. I love you so much. That was so beautiful. I love you so much. It was so instant when I met you there was like you know many people at that thing and I was like this person Mm -hmm. this person and we kept getting paired with each other Mm -hmm. it was the bus whether it's next to each other at dinner yeah we're always just sitting next to each other and going deep yeah and And no one's ever called me resplendent before so thank you well, I mean, you are. You look like you're lit from within. Well, we just did this, this wild dance activation, so I'm on fire. Yeah. So, and actually, you did that this morning, right? I did. You did our mutual friend, Brooke, who is helping me with Shout this. out to Brooke. Hi, Brooke. You're a genius. Um, who's been helping me birth this new movement, helping me take these sacred, potent, ancient tools and make them more attractive and accessible to a mainstream audience with the visuals and with the names. Anyway, she came on retreat with me and I love that she shared one of the practices with you this morning. I call it emotional alchemy, Mm. where you're basically just like dancing your feelings and alchemizing them into charge, into Mm -hmm. like pure life force creation energy. So you can create whatever you want with it. But I would love to talk about that because that to me is a type of training your emotions. It's not acting Mm -hmm. class, but it, it is tapping into your emotions and moving them. So what was that like for you this morning? I mean, you put a lot of you know great fancy words on it. For me, I just liked it to. I used it to get into my body. Yeah. And you attach rage to a song, mm-hmm. and then you just go for it. And for me, it was hitting my pillow. I was, I was, I was in an apartment, so I wasn't fully screaming, but I was screaming like I I would as loud as I could, but silently. Mm-hmm. And getting into my body and releasing whatever was there. The next one was sadness, and I got on the ground and I just got into a ball and I just moved around and let the music move through me and. Uh, got a bit emotional, and I, I feel like it, it was just something that allowed me, uh, allowed freedom to really start happening inside of me. And then the last one was um, activating your sexuality, and there was a really sexy song, and I feel like I turned into a character on Magic Mike, and I just I, there was a couple mirrors in the in the room, and I just started a performance really uh, for myself and for Karen. She was in the room. She, I um, bet she loved it. Yeah, zero applause, but I think she was she was <laughs> enthralled. Um, Daddy. So for me, it felt, (laughs) as an actor, I I always do my best to get in touch with my body and and have some alignment and attunement and groundedness. And so I feel like that was a cool strategy for the morning, just to kind of connect all the dots and to open myself up. Yeah. And I feel like when you do that, when you get in your body and when you move through the range of emotions, it's like you can come to the place of 
neutrality or open vessel or hollow bone. And then there's more spaciousness for source or God or whatever you want to call it to to embody you. Oh God, make of me a hollow reed from which the pith of self hath been blown so that I may become a clear channel through which thy love may flow to others. What's that from? Just a beautiful prayer from an ancient mystic poet uh, from Iran. Wow. Mm. Actually, not Rumi, someone else? I don't think it was Rumi. He was uh, might have been Hafez. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Well, look it up. We'll put it in the show notes. But will you say it one more time? Yeah. Oh God, make of me a hollow reed from which the pith of self hath been blown so that I may become a clear channel through which thy love may flow to others. This is it. I like, say that prayer every morning. You do? Mm-hmm. It shows. It shows. Oh. It's you beautiful. can feel pure essence, pure source flowing through you. And I feel like this is the game. This is the game in meditation. This is the game in emotional alchemy. This is the game in acting. Mm-hmm. Like you're becoming a vessel, a channel for the divine to flow through you. And when we get too clogged up with our own selfness, with our own individuality, with our own ego, with our own trauma, with our own story, then there's not that spaciousness, that hollow reed for God to use us as an instrument. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's it's a requirement when you're an actor, but those skills translate so beautifully to the re- to everyone who's not acting as well. Because guess what? We all have emotions as humans. So I would love to know, because when I ask you this question, right? I do like, want to add one thing to that. Yeah. Also, even when I don't feel like the clearest of channels, someone, I'm really not being great with my, my references today with the names, but an, we'll an amazing actor had said his insecurity... Uh, he wished he had known this earlier that his insecurity was not something that held him back from from uh, operating at his highest potential, his highest capacity. So sometimes we think if we're insecure, then we can't operate at our best. And a lesson he wished he would have learned earlier as a performer was just because he's insecure, that in no way holds him back from his best. And I, I think, so as much as I want to be a clear channel, uh, those times that I'm not, I, I can still hopefully be a channel even even against my you know my own blockages but say more like so why did he come to the conclusion that the insecurity helped him to be a better performer and how do you feel like on the days where you were obviously we're all still human right we haven't like yeah. disapparated we haven't evolved beyond the individuality <laughs> so Not like, we're, yet. we're still here so of course there's going to be humanness so how do you feel like that humanness or that fear or whatever is alive helps you to be a better performer well it's all part of it because we all have it i feel like when you perform in front of other people, I feel like you're at your, when we are witnessed is when we become truly activated, I think, when, when performing. And so whenever you're in front of other people, yeah, sometimes insecurities and fears come up, but they actually catapult you to greater heights. I think mm. someone said fear is the handmaiden of creativity mm. or anxiety is the handmaiden of creativity. And not that I want anxiety or I want fear, but if it's present, I'm not going to try to change it or push it away or want it to be something different because that just creates additional suffering, trying to yeah. change something that's yeah. present as opposed to welcoming it in yeah. and embracing it. Uh, and like that's the game in life. That's the game in acting. Like what is? What is right now? And that's what I really came away with in the cave. You know, mm. I was in the cave for five I want to hear about that. Yeah, it was wild. But I'll tell you, like, the big thing that I came away from is that if I try to feel my feelings with an agenda to transmute them... They're like, fuck off. No yeah. thanks. <laughs> no thanks. Like, you can't love this judgment with an agenda to transmute it. You have to just be in the judgment. You can't feel the rage with an agenda to turn it into love. You have to just honor and witness the mm-hmm. rage. And that was tough for me. Like, I'm a real, you know, love and light and met in bliss. And I mean, my playa name is Bliss. My Burning Man name is Bliss. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I can't wait to get a playa name. Oh, I hope I'm a part of that naming process. I'm very good at giving Burning Man names. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, but it's like what you just said. It's like we can't feel the feelings with the agenda to transmute them because that just creates more suffering. But why do you think people are so afraid of feeling their feelings? Well, I can only speak to myself on that is because I think that they're going to stay forever. They're going to last a long time or that I'm going to go into some kind of depression. Or if, if, if I'm feeling a certain way, I, there's some irrational fear that it's going to last a long time or that's going to become who I am. Mm. 
and it's it's never true. It's just like a storm, you know, and 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 you know the clouds will pass by. Eventually, the rainstorm will, the, you know, rainbows will always follow rain. Yeah. So it's, every storm runs out of rain is a Maya Angelou quote, which I love I very much. Love it. Mm-hmm. So it's that. So I think that there's just this, this, um, this false story that I've told myself because I've been through dark times in my life. I've been through places that I didn't feel I could get out of, and there were sometimes months that I was in these places. And so for me, anytime something may come up, that that feeling comes up of, oh no, I'm going back into the hole. And so there's a resistance to want to feel it. And I think as I've gotten older, I've learned that though just because I have a narrative in my head doesn't make it true. Mm-hmm. And it's really um, telling new stories, telling new narratives. And, and creating a new relationship with the with the old ones that seem to be circulating and on repeat. And do you consider that part of the emotional training? Like, why isn't everyone doing this? Like, not just the feeling of the feelings, but playing with what story am I subscribing to? Yeah, and becoming aware of what, what stories are present. I think that's the thing. We all have loop thinking. Everyone does. We're all just, you know, professional thinkers. We're constantly <laughs> thinking all day. and 70,000 of them a day. Oh, God, that's awful. So I think... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's awful if you don't like the content of them. Yeah, If you right? like the content of them, then it's like, oh, great. But I think because of conditioning, because of ancestral trauma, because of our, our past, there are going to be some thoughts that maybe we don't like or that aren't helpful. Mm-hmm. And I just want to be a useful human being. And so for me, I think... Useful to what? To serve life, to serve the world, to serve myself, to just, I just want to be useful. Um, and I think identifying what our inner narratives are is step number one. You know, when I was 25, I feel like my eyes opened for the first time. I'm like, whoa, this, this is who I am. And I was able to basically, I became awake. And then I realized all these psychological knots that I was dealing with in my last 15 years has been doing everything I can to untie those knots and basically moving everything that was in the shadows into the forefront. You what know, happened at 25? I, I don't know. That was just when... It wasn't like an event. It was just like, oh, nope, my prefrontal just, cortex is fully formed and here we go. Maybe. Maybe that's scientifically. <laughs> sure. I just remember being like, whoa, I'm here. I'm here now. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. And so I, I think when I came, I realized that the... You know the the model I was operating under, the paradigm that I was operating under, wasn't necessarily the one that was the most optimal for me, and I could see potentially what that was, but I couldn't get there, and that would created a lot of rifts internally. And so, identifying what the model was, disintegrating the model, building a new model, takes time, mm. and that's been my last fifteen years. And that's you know the paradigm shifts don't happen overnight, or maybe they do. But for me, the emotional work, the importance of emotional work is just to understand ourselves because the more we understand ourselves, the more that we are those, you know, those vessels, the more that we are open and available uh, to, to really respond and, and be a part of life. Mm. So when we started, you said that, that Karen, this beautiful dog sitting on my lap, so for those of you listening know that I have possibly the cutest dog of all time sitting on my lap, which is Travis's dog. And you said that this being of love came to you at one of the hardest times in your life. What will you, do you feel safe enough to share about Yeah, let's that? rock for sure. Um, do I feel safe enough? I feel safe with you. Let's go. Come on. Come on. <laughs> um, so my, Karen is only here because my last dog passed away and she passed away in a pretty traumatic way. She got hit by a car and she died in my arms as I was trying to resuscitate her. Mm. And that's, it's, you know, complicated story. Not everything, nothing is perfect. Um, I had turned my head in a park and I was helping some guy pump up his ball and I took a couple shots in the park and I let some kids that were under 10 play fetch with my dog, Nina, at the time. And I didn't tell the kids, hey, there's an opening in the fence there. Throw the ball anywhere else. I didn't, I didn't even tell the kids anything really. I just said, go have fun, play with the dog. And I, I turned my head away for too long and, and um, someone said, hey, is that your dog? And I'm just looking at my dog lying on the ground in front of a car. Oh. And it was just this, this moment. This was September 15th, 2018. And it was just, it was my first dog. And so it just ripped my heart open. It was a soul dent for sure. Soul contact happens through pain and, and through joy and through other means. But this was, whew, this was a tough one for me. And it took me, I didn't get her until April of 2020. So it took a little while mm-hmm. uh, to 
to be able to even want to get another dog. And the, I would try like every six months I'd look online and I'd start crying. I'm like, Oh, not ready. Okay. Mm-hmm. Don't want to, don't want to force it. But then when it was her time, she came and, and now I, I have to thank Nina for everything that I had with her. Cause I, I have this amazing dog and this dog is, she, Karen is incredible. And she's been such a blessing to so many people and to me. It's, and I, came mean, through I, pain. I see the way that you parent your dog and I can only imagine like the devastation of that, of that loss. And especially to like hold her as she passed. Have you ever been with a human when they transitioned? No, no, I don't think I have. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. And Harry, but have you, have you read Harry Potter? I've watched Harry Potter. I don't, you might not remember, but for me, a very significant scene was the Horcruxes. No, not the Horcruxes. I actually forget what they're called, but like the second year Harry comes back to Hogwarts and for a lot of kids, they just think that they're like floating across a river or something. Or like, it looks like people are just like floating, but Harry can see these like skeleton horses and he can see that there's actually something pulling these like seemingly like floating chariots and the people who had witnessed death could see the skeleton horses. But if you had not witnessed death, mm. then you couldn't see them. And my father passed when I was 24 and I was there in the room when he transitioned wow. and and something shifted like in that moment, like witnessing him transition. And it felt like I could see things in a new way mm. that I couldn't see before. Like maybe not dissimilar to when you were 25 and you were like, oh, I'm, I'm here now. Uh, and it's like when you face death or when you just acknowledge death, it makes you changes your relationship with life for mm-hmm. sure. And and so in that, I felt like I could see the horcruxes or whatever they're called. And so I wonder like if, if you doulaing Nina in that transition, like how that shifted your perception of life for you. I think in some ways it actually closed me up in the beginning. It made me not trust love because mm-hmm. I had such a deep love with this little puppy and people that don't have dogs are not going to understand, but there's just this unconditional unbounded love that you, you share with the, with the animal. And also like you, you do like parent your dogs, like children, like you're very, very involved, very present. Very much. Yeah. And there's been studies done about, about loss. And when you lose a pet, it, a similar part of the brain is activated as when you lose a child and it's not the same. I'm not saying it's the same at all, but it's related in some way. So it is a, it's a deep loss. I think for me, it, I stopped trusting love. Mm. Uh, and maybe, maybe I wasn't trusting love to begin with. Mm. And so maybe it showed me that, that that's how I was actually operating. And, and, and that let's was- Let's choose that story. Yeah. Let's, let's, choose, let's, that let's story. choose that story. And so it really helped me reorient and begin that journey to ask myself the deeper question about love and how I'm showing up and who I want to be. And yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty intense. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Your dogs are so lucky to have you. <laughs> um, so I love, so our, one of our first things that we bonded about was the fact that we had both learned a similar style of meditation and that we had both been to the same town in India, to Rishikesh, India, both done retreats there. Yeah. And so I'd love to just hear like, at what age did you start to feel like, oh yeah, I got to learn to meditate. Oh yeah, I got to go to India. And like, and mm. why? Like, why did you feel drawn to these practices? Well, they say that you, you know, you'll go to India when your soul is called to go to India. You know, India can, it's a um, it's such a beautiful place. Um, it's challenging in its own ways when you go. It's very different than any kind of living here. Um, my soul was called to go to India and I just answered that call. Um, meditation became a thing. I remember I got out of a relationship in 09 and it was a three-year relationship and I thought we were going to get married and we did and it just wasn't the right timing. And, and I, the next person that I was dating, she was into meditation and she's like, hey, I want to take you to go meditate. And at first I thought she was introducing me to a cult. <laughs> she's like, hey, I'm taking you to, to, to like follow your breath, you idiot. Like, <laughs> let's, go, just, let's go breathe together. <laughs> and I was so resistant and then we went to this um, this Buddha center and, and I started to go and I was just, I, I became enamored with Buddhism at that time. And I was really interested in, and in, in some of my acting training, we would, you know, follow the breath and we would do these breathing exercises, but it was never connected to some kind of spirituality. Um, and so I, I started to go really deep into it and, and then my journey started and then it's just following it's following where you where you get lit up, and I was Bread just comes from God exactly, and mm-hmm. I was just kept getting lit up in different directions, and one one of the directions led from uh, you know Caduce, 
Yeah. So Caduce and I played on the same basketball team. He and, was in my acting class. Oh, was he? Yeah. It's all connected. <laughs> so him and we, we had met and he had just told me that he had started this, this uh, he got into this meditation program and he loved it. And before that day, before I went to go play basketball, I had prayed that morning that I wanted to find a new, like a new deeper way to meditate. And it's just wild and you're, when your prayers get answered, like instantly. <laughs> Turns out if you're brave enough to ask, which is wild. I thankfully I asked, and Caduce basically was like, "Here," and he gave me information to Matthew Spangler, our mutual friend, our mutual who friend. I met Matthew in Rishikesh, India. We were both studying the Upanishads together. So we went deep into the Vedas, and I was I was fascinated and gripped. And yeah. from there, I wanted to go to the source, and so I planned a trip, uh, a, a month long sojourn to India. And the end of my trip was last fifteen days was in Rishikesh. And I went to this incredible um, ashram and experienced 10 days of silence. And it was, a uh, that was a ride. And so people were telling you not to go to that ashram though, right? So, so my friend Nidhi, her parents lived in India and I got to spend some time with them in Delhi mm -hmm. and they had never heard of this place. Uh -huh. I think it's called Ahin Ahisma. Um, I'll give you the actual, the link for the, for the ashram. Ahimsa or really Ahisma? Ahimsa? Yes. Do no harm. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, just showing off my Sanskrit. That's well, all. <laughs> I love it. Um, I I love Sanskrit. I, I loved it. I was so enamored with with all of Sanskrit. I, I wanted a tattoo it all over my body. I don't have a tattoo, but I've had so many moments where I've almost gotten a tattoo. Well, fun fact about Sanskrit is that it's it's an onomatopoetic language, meaning like an onomatopoeia is like boom, clap, bang. Mm. So those sounds are expressive of the thing. So. So Sanskrit is expressive mm -hmm. of the sounds of nature versus connotative or denotative, like most languages that, that are more modern, it's a word that points to a thing versus Sanskrit is actually like expressive actually the of the thing. feeling of mm -hmm. it, yeah. I learned so much being around you, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, <laughs> I showed, uh, I looked, I found this place online and I had showed it to Nitty's parents and they're like, ooh, we've never heard of that place, but we know this place. This is a place that all of our friends have gone, go here. And I just had this, little voice in me that's like, no, this is, this is the place. And so I show up in the evening and there is no one there. <laughs> and I'm in a new place. I'm kind of, I'm kind of scared. I'm in this, this, this place that I don't, I don't know what to expect. I've never been to an ashram. And so I start walking around the property and I'm not seeing anyone. I walk through their kitchen and I see sign, uh, these, all these drawings from kids. And in my head, I think, oh, this is just uh, them plotting to kill me. These are fake drawings. <laughs> Like real kids didn't draw these. They're just setting me up. I had all these these crazy stories in my head that I was gonna get murdered or something. And then eventually- You know, those crazy <laughs> meditation like, places. You know, they meditate, they get filled up with bliss and then they murder people. You know, <laughs> you know, we've all seen horror movies. Actually, has there ever been a horror movie about an ashram? No. no okay, I mean, maybe a sex cult, but yeah, like- <laughs> Right. Wild, maybe, maybe it turns into a sex cult, not that a sex country. cult is gonna kill you. Okay. <sighs> well, that would be an interesting, well, hey, these, these, that could be a cool plot. I mean, I guess there is the Osho documentary, but mm -hmm. anyway, back to you. Anyways, <laughs> so I, I end up in running into one of the, the up and coming swamis and I, they take me to my, 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 where I'm staying in this little cottage and everything was fantastic. And I did five days where I just got acquainted with the flow of the ashram. And then I did 10 days of silence. And um, it was one of those experiences where I feel like you, so when you, when you take away one faculty, all of your other faculties get heightened. And so every, everything became so heightened. And I actually, I really enjoyed not talking and not having to, basically turning down the impulse to speak. So my presence could really just become as vast as possible. And I could just listen with everything else and, and just really be there. And so for me, it, it freed me up to just relax. Mm in a way. And that was part of it. The other part of it was my mind was going crazy and it needed a place to express itself. And I, uh, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're being confronted because you're, you're being introduced to yourself in such a deep way and you're meditating all day long and you're doing yoga all day long. And we went to these different classes throughout the day where they would teach us the science of breath and you know, you're eating your food and you're chewing 33 times every bite. And did they tell you 33? Yeah. My doctor says 40. I'm like, that 
is a lot of chews. Yeah, who got the time for that? Let's go. Nobody got time for <laughs> 40 chews. I did it once. <laughs> I think I'm back to- I did it during the, when I was there. And it says it builds up the actual, the saliva that you need for proper digestion. So it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's like the beginning of the digestive process. You want to drink your food and eat your water is what my Ayurvedic doctor always says to mm. me. So it's basically liquefying your food. But okay, so you're going crazy. You're in your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your dreams become so loud. That's what I love. I wake up, I woke up a couple of times just bursting into tears. I had some dreams that showed me some of the trauma that I was working with. And it, it, it was a dream about my father and some of the stuff that he was carrying. We're all carrying trauma. And it was a dream about him. And it really showed me the more that we, we hurt others with our words, the more that we, we can punish others, we're actually punishing ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment when I had realized that my, my dad had been suffering in some ways and I, I cried for him mm -hmm. and I cried for that part that was alive in me. And it was just a moment when I also felt sadness because I knew I was on a journey to break the ancestral trauma line and it felt like I was like diverting from my roots. And it was just, it was just, there was a lot. It just felt so rich and so deep and so palpable. And there's so many, you know, turning off the faculty of your voice, so many other things just become, you know, loud and present. That's interesting though. I've never heard anyone say it that way, that as you heal the ancestral line, that there's a feeling of almost guilt or, or some story of like, I'm diverting from my roots. That like, oh, like there's something in you that wants the thing to propagate, that wants to continue mm. on the lineage. And that by healing it, it's like you're, you're changing the course of the lineage. So can you speak more to that? Like what was that story? Mm. Diverting away from your roots. Well, maybe, maybe we can, I can even change the narrative now. You know, it's been years since that was 2012. Thinking about it now, um, maybe it's not actually the sadness wasn't for, you know, maybe actually changing it and updating it isn't diverting from it. You're just updating it. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually honoring yeah. your lineage. So, so let's, I, I can reframe in yeah, the moment. A hundred percent. That's, that's what that is. And so and in 2012, that was my reaction. And yep. maybe that was much, much more of a, a me thing. Well, I do think the ego doesn't want to be destroyed. And if your ego is where you're coming from and where you're going to, then if you're changing that track, then in some way you are changing, you're destroying the ego. And so that might have been trying to protect itself by trying to honor that. Yeah, that's, that sounds it's very interesting. And, and you're very intelligent. Thanks. That's my most favorite <laughs> compliment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I grew up like, you know, whatever. I was like, a, like when moved to New York to model when I was 15 and then I was like an actress and, and, and I felt like I spent so much time being like, but look how smart I am. Hey everybody, look how smart I am. And I was like trying to prove mm -hmm. how smart I was like, I didn't get that because it was pretty. And like now that I'm 44, I'm just like, yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> I don't give a fuck anymore. I, I give a lot of fucks, but I give, I'm not trying to prove mm -hmm. anymore how smart I am. And I actually like want people to think that I'm pretty in a way that I was like trying to hide when I was 20. <laughs> It's just a funny relationship. Like, who said that people can't be smart and pretty? Like, what, when did we decide that dumb story? There's been a lot of dumb stories passed on. Yeah. You know, mine has always been about longing to belong. Mm. A lot of my drive has been that. I, I The way I interpreted my past is, is that I, I didn't belong and that I had to fix myself for change to fit in or to be liked or and to be valued. Was there like a time or like, was it on the playground or like, do you remember when or why that story started? I always wanted to be in cahoots with my dad and my brother. And there was Your always- Your brother's older? My brother's one year older, yeah. And so there was always this desire to kind of be part of the gang. And I just never felt like I was or that I was worthy of being part of the gang or that I was smart enough or interesting enough or clever enough or funny enough. Mm. And so I always felt like I had to be different in order to be accepted. And so for me, this longing to belong has always been an unconscious drive. You know, through a lot of the last 15 years, there's been, it's been this thing that's fueled me to, uh, to do a lot of things. And acting is a big part of it. Being of service is another way where in, if I, if I don't feel like I belong inside my own walls, when I go and I give back, if I'm being a big brother, if I'm building a school, or if I'm doing something for charity, I always feel like I belong internally there. I feel like I am so full and I am myself and I feel like I'm doing something that matters. And so belonging 
that's a big reason why I think service has always been a, a big lane in my life. Is I've always felt like I belonged when I've given back, and that's why I think there's this this um, there's this paradox around service where I feel like it's selfless and selfish at the same time, and that's okay. Why do you think the service helps you belong? Like belong to what? And what creates the belonging when you're in service? So I feel like when I'm giving back or doing something that's meaningful, it's helping the world. It's, 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 I feel there's a, such a purpose in being there. I feel like uh, there's just so much meaning to my life and the connections that happen and, and, and the possibilities that, that are, 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 are now possible through the service. That It just feels like there is this sense that all is right in the world. And it just in that in, in those moments, I always felt like I was really proud of myself and I love myself. I didn't have to change a thing about myself mm. to fully be me. Mm. And so it was it, I felt like I belonged. And mm. and I, you know, the more I would do that, the the more I think, you know, you plant seeds inside yourself where you, you know, you're just, you know, uh, making soul deposits. <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of what the whole process of serving for me has been. So for you, when you're in service, it feels like a soul deposit. You're depositing seeds inside of yourself that grow. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent, for sure. Mm. Yesterday, we had a guest on who's um, a psychotherapist and a spiritual psychologist, uh, like a somatic psychotherapist and a spiritual psychologist, two master's degrees. And she was saying that, um, that purpose is the antidote to suffering. And it sounds to me like when you are in service, that feels like your purpose, which is an antidote to this particular flavor of suffering. Beautiful. Yeah. 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 Do you want to live inside my brain? I would love to. Great. You're is welcome. It, oh, Just great. come on in any time. Do you have to pay rent or anything <laughs> nope. or is it, it's free? It's free. Great. Because my rent in New York is very expensive. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. I won't burden you with rent. Just oh, come anytime. Great. And I'll just like shout like affirmations and like 100%. reframe stories. Thank you. Wait, I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not. Not what I do, you know. Like, yeah, it's help. Not, not what you. It is what you do, actually. <laughs> I like help yeah. people create new neuroplasticity. A lot of people like have me in their brain when they're meditating. I love it. Well, we fun. did one this morning. We meditated, and and the way that you led us into it was such a soft entry that you can't help but just like sink into mm. yourself. Mm. So, so I'd love to hear about that. But when you learned to meditate with our friend Matthew Spangler, like what shifted it for you? Can you remember Travis pre meditation and then? you know, who you hmm. think meditation has helped you evolve into? I don't think it's such a quick uh, change. Uh, so for me, I don't, I don't think I noticed a giant shift uh, right away. I think I, I was empowering myself to know more of the truth and finding access to that. And I think... What's the truth mean to you? Uh, there's a quote. I think it's really important, the quotes that we're drawn to and the things that we say over and over in our life. And I was always drawn to a Rumi quote. Our task is not to... Seek out love. Seek for love. Our task is to seek and find all the barriers that we've built up against it. And so for me, I feel like a lot of my journey has always been knocking down those walls that I'd built up against love. And so the truth for me was behind those walls. And so mm-hmm. for me, every time I would meditate or every time I would take an, a, a step towards healing in some way or, or emotional release or community or connection or whatever it is, I feel like one block of that barrier would be removed and I'd have more access to my own truth. Mm. That's kind of what the idea is. So over time, consistently meditating, and, and it's changed. My meditation practice has transmuted and it's there's been many different iterations of it and that's okay. At first, I used to get a little judgmental of myself about it. Like it has to be this way. And I was so, I was so rigid, Yeah. Um, but it changes, it transforms. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just like life. Everything is moving. It's an, and so I think, I think for me, I just felt like I was doing something that was good for my soul, for my mind, for my body. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to keep doing it because mm-hmm. I felt great afterwards. And not that the goal was to feel great, but usually the byproduct is feeling great. Mm. I would just love to double click on that for a moment because so many people think, well, like I can't meditate because I can't clear my mind. And it's like, well, yeah, if you're trying to clear your mind in the practice, you're going to feel like you're failing because the mind thinks involuntarily, just like the heart beats involuntarily. Mm -hmm. And yet if you do the practice and you let the thoughts come up and you let it be a catharsis tool and a purging tool, then the 
impact of that, the result of that is more clarity on the other side. Mm. So yes, you will feel more clear as a result of meditation, but you don't get there through the clearing of the mind. So thank you for letting me get on that soapbox because just yeah. every opportunity I can <laughs> hey. just remind people. Hey, you are you are helping a lot of people with with teaching them how to meditate. So the more you can talk about it, the better. Mm. Okay, so you felt like meditation was helped you get to the truth. It wasn't a fast transition, but no. each time you were doing something good for your soul, it was removing a barrier to the love that was already inside you, which helped you get more to the truth. Yeah, and I, I think even even now, I think it's it's a primer. For me, I feel like it primes me for the day. It primes yeah. me to be attuned to myself. It, it's a big release. Like you're just releasing the pressure out of the, you know, the air out of the balloon. I feel like it's something that every time I meditate, I feel like I'm doing it so that I can be in alignment with my, my highest self. And I think we do, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of times there are certain things that might be in our way from the day before or from some kind of trigger that we experienced on a phone call or whatever it is. And every time I meditate, I feel like I'm getting back to center. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the purpose for me currently. Mm. And how do you feel like that attunement, that getting back to center, like obviously like one meditation is not going to change your whole life, but uh, everyday meditation, twice a day meditation, coming back to center, coming back to love, coming back to attunement over however many eight, nine, 10 years you've been doing this. Like, how do you feel like that has shifted your trajectory or who you are? Yeah. I'm at 11 years now. No, wait, I started in 2010. Okay, 13. 13 years of meditation. Let's celebrate. Oh. 13 is my lucky number. <laughs> is that your lucky number? Mm-hmm. I think we have to celebrate. I, I, I want to celebrate more in my life. I feel like a lot of times we just push to the next thing. and We don't take a moment to really celebrate. 13 years, that's an incredible thing to celebrate. Yeah, 13 so, years of meditation is hard. I'm on it. There's lots go. of emails to answer and you know Facebook to be on and YouTube. Facebook? Uh, whatever, I'm old, I'm 44. <laughs> <laughs> what are you on, TikTok? Um, what are you on? Uh, I don't even really do TikTok that much, but I'm on Instagram, so that also ages me too. But what I think, <laughs> what, what I think meditation... So for me, one thing I know about my design, my blueprint, and maybe all, maybe this is everybody, but I sometimes I'll check out, like I'm, I will be uh, offline, and then I'll realize I'm offline. Ah, let me get back online, and I'll go back online. Meditation is exactly that. You're meditating. You realize you t- you follow a thought. You get lost in something. You don't even know how much time has gone by, and then you go, oh wow, I clearly just indulged in that thought. Ah, let me go back to center, go back to your breath. And you're practicing that process of disengage, re-engage, disengage, re-engage. And to, for me, it's, I think it hopefully is just strengthening that muscle. So when in your, you're in your life and you find yourself like completely in autopilot, you go, oh, it was just an autopilot. Why don't I come back? Come and back. here I am. And doing it in a way that's um, not destructive or judgmental or you know, harsh. And I think that's another thing that meditation has been a process for me is to, there's a voice in my, my head, a critic, this, 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 this voice that just wants to like judge or punish. And I've had to really identify what that is and soften, like turn the volume down on that thing. I don't have to let it go away because it's been programmed in me. So it can be there. It just doesn't have to be at level 10. <laughs> like, yo. Like, the judgment voice. Yeah, let's go yourself. down like a level two. Sure. And even of others. If I'm judging myself, I'm judging others. So it's, it's, it's connected. And I think meditation is something that's also probably helped me understand that more and rearrange that and um, fine tune that. Can you help me? I have an alter ego. Her name is Judge Judy. Oh, mine's, and- mine's Vladimir. Oh. What, what's Vladimir do? What's what's he's he? He's dirty. He's he's, he's Russian. <laughs> what's he protecting? He does bad things. <laughs> to who? Everybody. <laughs> he's very horny. This guy. <laughs> yes, he's he. Uh, hmm. He likes women. What's the worst thing Vladimir's ever done? Yeah, I can't tell you. <laughs> I would have to kill you. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm sorry. You, who's yours? <laughs> oh, well, one of them is Judge Judy, and she's very judgmental, but like of other people. And I recognize in my intellect that all judgment is judgment of the self, but Judge Judy does not. Mm-hmm. She thinks that she is better than everyone else. She loves being right, and she loves uh, just judging people. Do you pay royalties to the actual Judge Judy? I should. Okay. <laughs> I really should, or I should maybe just call her Judy. Um, but it's... Uh, 
it's it's one of the things I went into the cave for because mm-hmm. I was like, this is not it. Like, this is not who I want to be. This is not who I want to be in myself and my relationships. Certainly not with my son. And I don't judge. Thankfully, it doesn't show up in my, in my relationship with my son yet. You know, I'm sure that it will mm-hmm. as he gets older and more <clears throat> individuated. Um, but like, legitimately, I'm I'm asking like, is there something that when you find yourself in that judgmental space in your day? that you do or say to yourself or shift to where that helps you to soften? I'm trying to think if there's an actual, you know, if there's like a gong that you like just to like bring you back. I don't know. I think, I don't know if there's an actual thing. For me, it's been, I, I've been using my breath a lot. And so for me, if one thing that I've been trying to do is if I find myself disengaged with my own life, I will take three breaths three slow breaths, put my hand on my heart and my stomach. And I'll st- wherever I am, I'll just stop and I'll do this. And then I'll... Let's just do it now. I just everyone listening. Unless you're driving, you can keep your hands on the wheel and you can breathe. But if you're not driving, just put one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly. I'm going to have to squeeze my hand underneath the butt of this adorable <laughs> dog. <laughs> and let's just breathe in through our nose. And exhale, and if you're in private and you can exhale in the sound of God, the sound of ah. Another big breath in, this time all the way down to your heart. Again, exhaling on the sound of ah. And this time breathing all the way down to the hoo-ha, being sure to invite Vladimir to the party. <laughs> ah. Feeling your shoulders drop. Karen's getting into it. She's looking at <laughs> <in> my face. <laughs> and it's just sometimes it's that simple. Sometimes it can be that like that easy to come home. It's not rocket science. Mm-hmm. And just to be clear, Vladimir is not my internal alter ego. He's he's a, a role that I play in the world. That I've actually I've actually used him um, in relationship. In like romantic relationship? Yeah. Like Vladimir comes out like when you want to hunt or... Also to, you know, I remember this. <laughs> this was, I don't know how many years ago, but I was I, I would actually use him to say the things that I didn't have the courage to say myself. Ooh, that's so genius. Can you give us a little example? It doesn't have to be like the most embarrassing thing, but like it just, it, it can even be made up. Like you're in a fight with your girlfriend or your girlfriend has done something annoying or... Yeah, situation where I want to right a wrong, or situation where I feel like I'm, I'm like lost out to sea, and I, I can't connect in a way because I've done something that's hurt my partner. I, I don't know. I've used. I feel like there's a way you can role play. Yeah. To get yourself back. Yeah, I was just interviewing. I think the same woman, Alyssa Nobriga, brilliant, you know, double master's degree, and she was saying that she and her partner, she and her husband, are married for 14 years. They have three kids. They both have successful businesses. And every single week they they make time to like come together. And then she said if there's a clearing or if there's something that's up, she'll sort of like amplify it a little bit. Like if she'll say, hey, do you have space to hold? <laughs> and then if he says yes, if he's feeling resourced, and then she's like, okay. And then she just purges, but she like cranks up the volume on the annoyance. And she's like, you're the worst husband of all time. And you haven't listened to me and you didn't do the dishes. And like, and just lets it be dramatic. But it's like in this container of consent and knowing that he has resources, I'm like, that's so genius. Mm. And also speaks to this idea of like, why isn't everyone doing emotional mm. training? Because it's like, if you were taking acting classes, if you knew how to embody different pieces of yourself, if you didn't think that that judgment was you or that that Vladimir piece of you was you or that that shyness or not belonging was the totality of you, then you could actually like lean into mm-hmm. it and express it. So I would just love to know from you, like when, if you could wave a magic wand and like the whole world is doing some sort of emotional training, the whole world is taking acting classes, like why? Well, specifically there would be, I think everyone should do this exercise. So I did an exercise in some of my training called the relative exercise. And I think a lot of us, if you're human, you have family dysfunction, (laughs) you know, par for course. And I think the relative exercise, it's where you actually embody body and you portray one of your relatives and you go on stage, you dress like them, you talk like them, you walk like them, you think like them, and then the entire class will ask you questions and you answer as them. And so I think 
if we were all to play this game, we would build a bridge of empathy to our family members in a new way. And so what I did, I did this relative exercise with, uh, I was my sister. And my sister had just gone through this big breakup. It'd been a year since she'd been, she'd always been mourning this thing and always crying every time I talked to her. And I had no patience for her. I did not have space. I'm She's like, Dana, older get younger? Young, when you're younger. I was uh-huh. like, get over it. And how old were you at this time? Uh, this was probably like 2006. Okay. So I was probably yeah. in my late 20s. Okay. Um, so I... I just didn't have, I, I wasn't giving her a safe space to share, to be seen, valued, or heard. Yeah. And I was kind of like running to rush her through this process. And so I just, I dressed like her. I had on some clothes that she would wear. And I forgot, maybe even more like a long skirt. And, you know, I, I pushed my hair to the side. She had bangs at the time. And I had her, her I did her voice. And it was, I was probably <laughs> nowhere near her actual voice. But the class asked me questions. And, and, at first, it was just this lighthearted, you know, question and response, and and then they asked me about love, and I started talking about my last relationship as my sister. I started talking about my last relationship, and as I started talking about it and the pain that I was currently going through, I started to cry. So I was crying as my sister mm-hmm. on stage in front of thirty whatever people. But I was my I was channeling my sister. I was being my sister. I was I was thinking like my sister. I was doing everything I could. And I'm not a crazy person. I knew that I was Travis in that moment. But this is an exercise, you know, to really throw yourself out there and to imagine. And so I was. And I and I as my sister, I I felt the depth of her pain. And I had not taken the time or been able to feel that when connecting with her as her brother. And after class, I called her and I apologized. I said, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't understand the depth of your pain. I feel it. I understand it now. And I love you. And it was something that helped me understand her. And I, I think acting, mm-hmm. emotional exercises, I think it can only be helpful. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think it can hurt. And I, I think it, it just does something to allow you to hopefully understand someone else in a new way. Mm-hmm. Understand yourself in a new way. Like tears are coming up because I'm realizing like how many times in my life I've done that because it's so, I think I am so energetically sensitive and I am so empathetic that it's really hard for me sometimes to be in the, in someone else's pain without me taking it feeling all on. It. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, that's the whole game. It's like, we don't feel comfortable feeling the bigness of our own feelings. Many of us have not been trained on how to regulate our own nervous systems Mm. or where to put or how to express our feelings. So then if someone else is feeling big feelings, it's like we have to protect ourselves from it. And the only thing we know Mm. how to do is to minimize that or to change it or to try and get them to something that feels good to us. And I I see it happen. You know, my son is four, he's almost five, but like you see it happen on the playground. Like playgrounds are fascinating Little ecosystems. Yeah, little ecosystems, <laughs> petri dishes of like what's happening emotionally in society because this is where the roots of it all are, mm. right? So like a kid falls down, they're bleeding, they're scared, they're in pain and the parent runs over. It's like, you're fine, you're okay, you're fine, you're okay, you're fine, you're okay. And it's like, wait a minute, this kid is bleeding, scared and hurting. And now you as God, because we have to deify our parents, are telling them to override what they're actually organically feeling and telling them that they are okay because you want them to be okay because you don't know how to handle sitting in your own pain and discomfort of your child's pain. And and so I like created a whole like kids meditation training because of this, because Whoa. I was like, kids don't know how to feel their feelings. And the whole point of it is like, to your point of the storm, right? It's like the emotions, there's the mad stormy, the sad stormy, and the scared stormy. And it's just like, these are just storms, right? And like your bliss is always there and you're allowed to feel it. And so like being a mom has been such a training ground for me to like sit in the discomfort of his pain, to sit in the discomfort of his rage, to sit in the discomfort of his fear and not try and fix it. That plus being friends with Layla Martin and Regina Thomashauer, mm-hmm. like they've been a masterclass in teaching me the beauty of catharsis in the in the power of feeling your feelings and and so I feel so grateful for that and I see how far I have to go and like I've been acting since I was eight Hmm. 
I have been doing this like transmutation work. I've been doing this emotional alchemy work. I have these world-class leading friends in this industry and still it feels like a challenge. And most of the world is just like, oh, I'll just have another glass of wine or put on another show. Hmm. And so like, I really feel passionately about this, of this idea of like, why isn't the whole world doing emotional training? And, and I think the reality of every single person on the planet doing an acting class is low. But if you had to like give <laughs> someone an assignment, I mean, I know you said the, the relative exercise, but is there something else that might be like, I don't know, like a starter kit for someone that doesn't know how to feel their feelings or that feels like a little stuck? Well, I want to go back. You said some really powerful stuff. So I just want to, I just want to take two steps back. You know, you mentioned this idea of you not being able to feel your pain so you don't feel someone else's. And that's kind of the problem that we have in the world. And I really relate. That's such a great way of putting it. And I think learning how to do that for our partners is something that I know I have failed deeply at. And I'm learning how, to, you know, I want to be great at that is holding space for your partner to be messy and to not get it right and to, you know, for, for their pain or whatever their dysfunction is. And I think in prior relationships, I wasn't okay with my own. And so I didn't have a lot of space f for their freedom of expression. Mm. And you, that's a, that's a lose-lose scenario in intimacy. Yeah. That's, a, that's, that's, that's like, love can't win on a battlefield. Oof, say that one again. Well, love can't win on a battlefield. <laughs> Wait, please call a pop songwriter that needs to be a song immediately. <laughs> Taylor Swift, did you hear that? Yeah, um, Taylor Swift, come on. Miley Cyrus. But that's something that I've always been, um, you know, um, the story that I've told myself is I'm a late bloomer. And emotionally, you know, I feel like I've been. Is that true? Uh, I was always the youngest kid in my grade. I was the last person to get a phone or a car. I was always. There was, there was, there's a certain story I've told myself over the years. Okay. Um, um, but I'm starting to understand how I've shown up in my past relationships and how ineffective that is to create a safe place for intimacy, for sustainable intimacy. Um, but it touches on what you said. That's why I want to double back on it. It's so important, this idea of if we can't have space for our own pain, we're, we're going to have trouble holding other people's. Yeah. And... Um, that's part of the work. That's part of what meditation has also been for me and all the, the spiritual journey and all the acting classes and the emotional work is creating a space so that I can hold my own pain um, so that I can then do it for someone else. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why like we have this stereotype that like men want to fix it. That like, oh, like I come to my, like, and this is very heteronormative, cisgendered, male, female, straight relationship. But the stereotype there is that like the woman comes to the man feeling feelings, feeling emotion. And instead of holding it, witnessing, just letting them be in it, letting them express it, it's like, we got to fix it. It's like, well, where does the fixing come from? It's like, well, because historically and traditionally men have not been given an archetype to feel their feelings mm -hmm. or to feel comfortable with it. So of course, seeing the person that you love the most in the world, that you feel a sense of responsibility for, they're coming to you with a problem. Like, of course you would try and fix it because it's like your discomfort is making me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's my job, right? Like I'm the protector, I gotta fix it. Mm -hmm. And actually the only thing that wants to have happen is to be witnessed. Mm. And what I meant by late bloomers, I'm now learning that. I'm 40, I just turned 40. Happy birthday, I welcome mean, to in, the most amazing November, decade. It's the best decade so and far. And also the sexiest decade. It's, it's been pretty great so far. Great. Um, <laughs> but that's what I meant by late bloomer is, it was attaching it to the emotional understanding of what you're speaking about and being able to really create harmony in a relationship because that's so important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, sorry. Acting exercise or an exercise I would... Yeah, like if, if you could give the world like a starting kit in training their emotions, like because realistically, they're probably not going to go to an acting class, <sighs> but like something they could do with their kid, with their partner in a mirror, like just a way to be like, I'm not good at feeling my feelings. I want to start. Oh, man. What do I do? You know what's wild? Tell um, me. And this is, I mean, this is um, super new agey stuff, or maybe it's not. I don't know. But It's a pretty new agey show. But okay, great. It feels like it because I feel like I'm, I'm talking very new agey. <laughs> um, but I guess that's who I am. Uh, so eye gazing was something that we would do this in acting class. And it was one of those things where you would basically do your best to remove your walls, remove your self-judgment, really see the other person, look deeply into them, feel them, 
And it was the process of letting somebody see you, letting, letting yourself be seen and also seeing. And anyone can do this. I remember this was, I took, I took four years off of uh, alcohol, of cannabis, of any kind of extracurricular activity in my late 20s because I just wanted to see what life was like without that. And during that process, my, uh, my father and I used to always have a deep connection where we would, we would have, you know, some, some drinks and we would always listen to music and connect. And, and when I, that was taken off the table where I wasn't that anymore, I had to re- reestablish a relationship with my father in a new way. And he came to see me for a Super Bowl one year. We would celebrate, we'd watch the Super Bowl every year in LA and we'd always have a big party. And this was the first year that I wasn't drinking. And afterwards, uh, this was the next day before they were leaving, I wanted to connect with my dad so deeply and I suggested we do eye gazing. And my dad's not, not the kind of guy that would be down to do that. And, and uh, I asked him and he said, okay. And I looked over to my mom who's sitting on the couch and she looked up at me like, oh my God. And so I was like, oh my God, I mean, he won. okay. So I, I told him the rules or the, you know, the, the, I created the safe space and then we did it. And at first, we did it for two minutes. I said, you know, mom set the timer. <laughs> and we did it for two minutes and I looked into my dad's eyes and I saw a little bit of a wall at first. I saw fear. And then as soon as that layer dissolved, I saw pain and I saw this little boy and I saw my dad as a little boy. And it was, it was something where it was, it was, I saw pain in there and maybe unexpressed pain and I connected to it and he was feeling me connect to it. And, you know, then the exercise ended and, uh, I, I, we went really deep in that two minutes and I actually think my father distanced himself a little bit after that. I don't think we spoke for a little while and not in a way that he was like punishing me. I just think he, he needed his space, but I remember that was such an impactful two minutes where I actually got to really experience my father and he got to be seen very deeply. And I don't know if we go through life, you know, eye gazing with people, but that's one. And not men, right? Because you're looking out, like we're hunting. We're both looking at the animal. That's why I think sports, it's like, oh, we'll both watch the sports together. We're parallel. Look at the fire. Parallel play, look at the fire, look at the sports, look at the animal. But to actually turn that gaze to each other, bravo, Travis. (sighs) It was a moment. And you saw me almost get emotional there because it was, it meant something to me because in that moment, I got to understand my father, which is one of, that was always such a a goal of mine as a young man. I want to know who you are, where you come from. And my dad comes from a different time. And, you know, he wasn't always uh, as as open to discuss these kind of things. And now, very different. My dad is a softy. Did you blow the lid up? I mean, I would not take responsibility for that. My life has taught, life has been my dad's greatest teacher. Mm. You know, life, his father passing away and his brother killing himself and, mm-hmm. you know, some life, life teaches us. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe I had some small part in that. Um, I'm quite sure that as his son, you've been one of his greatest teachers. Uh, he, it's, it was a moment where I actually got to, I got to know my dad in a way that I'd been yearning for, wow. for a long time. And did you ever talk about it? Did you ever integrate it? Like, did he ever share what no. his thing was like? It's just, that Not was it. Once. Wow. I never asked again. I, I don't know. <laughs> Could you? I feel like, can I give he's you that in homework town, assignment? He's in town now. Maybe I should ask him. Yeah, just be like, hey, do you remember that crazy thing we did? Like, yeah. what was that like for you? Did you think I was insane? Did it feel vulnerable? Like, y- Yes, what? yes, yes. All of the above. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to hear. Yeah. And it's just, it's its own medicine journey, right? It's a two-minute medicine journey mm-hmm. to, to peel away the layers, to get to the soul connection. I mean, that's one of the things that medicine does for us, one of the things that meditation does for us. And so I think you know integration is a really important part of that, and it's never too late to yeah, integrate. Yeah, so that was, yeah, maybe thirteen years later, twelve years later. Cool. We'll integrate. And this, by the <laughs> way, is like the exact perfect exercise. Thank you so much for giving this this assignment. So anyone listening. If you're feeling like you want to feel your feelings a little bit more, if you feel like you'd love to do some emotional training, if you feel like a little stuck or just want to deepen your intimacy with your partner or your kid or your relative or your parent, like you could frame it. So can you give us like, what did you say to help create safety and how did you structure it or, or position it? I, the way I, I structured it was this is an exercise that's going to allow us to really connect deeply. It's a safe space. And it's natural to feel insecure, to have judgment come up, or to want to protect, to laugh, to be uncomfortable, to hide. It's very natural to do this. So when that happens, allow it, 
But the goal is to remove any barrier between the connection and to really open yourself and also to really like want to deeply connect with the other person too. Mm -hmm. So allow yourself to be seen, but also see. see. And so setting it up in that kind of way, I think, and it's a safe space. This is a safe container. There are no wrong ways to do this. Uh, But the goal is to see each other. What'd your mama say? I don't think we ever spoke about it. You got some homework assignments? (laughs) (laughs) Also, I just love, so you have a giant TV show coming out tomorrow. It'll all be out by the time we release this. It's called FUBAR. You're Mm -hmm. starring in it with Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is so exciting. I want to hear more about that. But I know tomorrow's the premiere. Your parents are in town. And I know that yesterday you took your parents shopping. And I'd really love to hear a little bit about that, if you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, my mom and dad are married for 42 years. Mm Mm-hmm. And as in any couple, they've, they've had, you know, their hard times and, you know, they've had their own hurdles that they've had to go through, through the years. um, Wow. They have, they have rekindled, reignited their love. They are the happiest I've ever seen them. The kindest, the most thoughtful, the most loving. They are just hilarious and an amazing couple. And to watch my mom and dad, to be able to continue a marriage through 42 years and to have it be thriving maybe now more than ever. It's really inspiring. I'm really proud of them. Wait, we got to get them on the show. I want to interview them. (laughs) That would be incredible. No, legitimately. Oh my God, I would (laughs) love to see that. Um, So they're in town. Um, I have this incredible uh, makeup and hair lady named Kimberly coming and she's going to do my mom's hair and makeup tomorrow. My mom's got this incredible dress and she's going to get pampered and all done up. And my dad, he always wears the same suit and it's just, you know, it's a, it's, it's definitely something to forget. And (laughs) I, uh, and I, I just wanted to get him something really nice that he looked really good in and I brought up the idea and he was open to it, but you know, not the most excited. And I found this great place on Abbott Kinney because I'm staying in the marina and we walk in there. And at first he's like, I, yeah, I don't know what, I don't know what I, Sally, what do I want? Like you just, you pick. And I was like, no, 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 dad, this is your time. This is your moment. This is your suit. What, what are you drawn to? You can wear anything. Like what, 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 what suit are you drawn to? And he's like, yeah, I don't know. I like, I don't know. I don't ever wear these. I was like, dad, just p- find that gravitate towards whatever one you want, whatever suit you like. You can try them all on. A guy came over to help us and my dad found this one green suit that he loved and my mom looked at the price tag and she's like, no, 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 we can't, we can't do this. We, this. And I, and normally I'd be like, mom, stop. Like, it's fine. Instead, I just kind of let her have her moment and I didn't say anything. And um, my dad went and tried on the suit and at first he was, you know, he was, he was a little shy with it, but when he walked out with the suit on, he looked like, a million bucks. He looked so incredible. He had a beaming smile and you could tell he was, we were, I told him, I said, you look amazing. This is the suit. They, they pinned it. So they tailored it to him. And when he was getting dressed uh, afterwards, my mom pulled me aside and said, no one's ever done that for your dad. And it was just a moment. I'm like, oh, I got to have that. I got to have that moment where I, I, I wanted this to be about him. And he's got this incredible suit and I can't wait for, for, uh, for him to wear it tomorrow and just to feel incredible. And it was just, a, it was a nice moment. It was a really nice father-son moment to have. Oh, I can't wait to see the press photos. We're gonna like put one of the photos in the show notes or something. Amazing. We'll link to it. Cause yes. I wanna see your whole family on the red carpet. 100%. What are you most excited about like for the premiere? And then what was the most fun of shooting the show? Because we've done a lot of premieres like this, or does this feel like special? And like, I mean, shooting a show with Arnold Schwarzenegger feels like a big deal. Yeah, very surreal to be filming with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I've looked up to that man for most of my life. Mm-hmm. And he is the paragon of self belief, vision, and execution. This guy has manifested everything he's wanted in his life. He is, he's like, he's the apex, he's the, like, the zenith of achievement and accomplishment. And I love the man. And so to have all of this coming into film with him, that's a lot. That's a lot to, <laughs> you know, this pressure. man's never met me. <laughs> I've known him my whole life. And so when I, f- I first met him, I had to let him know all the things I respected about him. I really believe if we feel respect, we have to share it. And I just, I just dumped all my respect on him. And I told him all the movies I liked and how his, his bodybuilding meant so much to me and his movie Pumping Iron inspired me. And, da, 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 and I just, just like threw it at him. 
and then I began to establish a, a relationship with them. And we were colleagues, now we've become friends and it's just an incredible experience. Um, and so to be working alongside him and to go toe to toe, I've got some scenes. I've got some really cool scenes with him. One scene, my character pulls back the layers and he's opening up and the director told me, he's like, you know, you don't have to go all Meryl Streep, but like, let all your anger come out. And this is a comedy. So they probably are not going to use the, the, this take, but all these, I, I let all my anger come out. And because I hadn't planned that, all this emotion came to the surface and it was my close up. And as I'm acting, it's a scene with Arnold. I'm having all this emotion come up and I'm watching him have an emotional reaction and be affected by me. And I left my body and I had the moment of, whoa, I'm making Arnold feel things. And I'm like, ah, Travis, get back in your body. You're in the scene. And I got back in my body and then I finished the scene. Um, and afterwards he goes, that was captivating. And it's like a moment like, oh my God, that was, that, that, that was, that was a moment for me. And there were so many moments throughout filming that they just, they were very surreal. And this premiere means so much to me because of the stage I'm at in my life. So I just entered a new decade. I've been doing this now for 20 years. Uh, it just, I get it. I've been, I've been through a lot. You know, I've, I've definitely, I've, I've been in the trenches. I've been doing this for a long time and I know when there's something really special and this is a really special show and it's, it had that feeling on set and we all just really vibed and the writing is fantastic and it's Arnold. And so to me, this, this premiere is, um, it's a, it's, it's a moment for me that I will celebrate this moment. Like we said in the beginning, I will, I will take time and really take this in to celebrate because it's something to be celebrated. Yeah. Yeah. My prayer for you is that as much as possible, which certainly won't be a hundred percent, but as high as percentage as possible that you really are in your body and that you savor and mm. savor and savor again and savor and savor and savor again. And something that's helped me with that mm. is that I'm in a moment, you're on the red carpet or you sit down to watch it or you and Arnold are toasting champagne or whatever. Smoking a cigar probably. I've gotten to get pretty, I've gotten pretty good at doing that. Although when I first started, the smoke would like burn my corneas and I tried to be cool and it made me really sick. But if after the season of doing it many times, I feel like I'm pretty good at it. Because he loves cigars or yes. it happens in the show? Him and I got to smoke cigars together. He is a he smokes cigars a lot and I just wanted to connect with him in that way. So cool. <laughs> threw myself in. I love that. So if you're smoking cigars that you just like feel it, like see it, hear it, taste it, feel it, smell it, and then just say either in your mind or out loud, like imprint. Mm. Like, imprint, like you're... Like you're taking a photo and you just imprint it in your nervous system so that it's like there for your deathbed slideshow. I had that imprint yesterday with my dad. So I get it. Like that kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah. Beautiful. I'll say yes to that assignment. Great. What do you think your parents, what do you attribute your parents rekindling or second or third mountain to? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think they had to, they got to a turning point in their relationship where it could have ended or they're going to double down. And they chose very much to double down. And from that moment forward, uh, this, their journey has, yeah, their relationship has become significantly different. And again, it's through- How long ago was the doubling down? This was- probably 10 years ago, I'd say. Okay. So it's been some time. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I feel like they both have begun, like my mom started to really stand up for herself and she grew a backbone and she's, the more she's begun to know herself and speak up for herself, the more my, my father has just softened and uh, the, their respect, the respect level they have for one another is so deep. My mom said something so sweet yesterday. She, my dad was at the grocery store. We went together. My mom stayed at the apartment and, and, uh, he wanted to get her this creamer that she loves and, um, and, and bagels cause she loves whatever. And my, I called my mom to see if we had any coffee beans at the house. And she goes, isn't your father the sweetest? God, he just loves me so much. I love him. And it was just that moment. Like that's, Whatever they're doing, they're doing an amazing job. I'm very inspired by it. And, you know, maybe that wasn't always the tone 
when we were younger. Maybe, maybe, maybe they've had to grow into this and it's something, maybe that was the tone. I don't know. I've interpreted my past in my own way. Who knows how truthful it is? That's another conversation about how, you know, are, are we just remembering some false memory that we've created in our mind or is it actually the truth? And I don't, I don't think we, we know, but they're, they're, they're in a lane right now that I'm, that's just really beautiful. And I feel mm. like I'm learning a lot from. Mm. I just want to celebrate them and you. And it's so good to hear stories like that. And as far as the truth in our past and the lens, I, I think that as we usher ourselves into higher states of consciousness, as we inevitably evolve because life becomes our teacher, then we change the lens through which we see the past. Yes. And if we change the lens through which we see the past, we actually change the past. And if we are in fact mm. evolving, then it up levels the past. And if past version of us is up leveled, then that cannot help but up level the current version of us, which guess what? Up levels the future version of us. So then when the if more evolved or angel self of you looks back on you, that's up leveling you. So it really can become this like infinity loop of upward spiral provided that you are in fact increasing your state of consciousness in the now. And when those two things meet, past you and future you come together, there's like this thing called a Rashi, which is this huge surge in consciousness. And all it takes is continuing to remember that you are the ocean pretending to be the wave mm. and to continue to examine the past and the future, to examine what is the truth and to feel our feelings in some way like this beautiful exercise that you gave us, gave us to simply gaze mm -hmm. into the eyes of another wave, right? Another ocean pretending to be wave, another God pretending to be human. Mm. That's beautiful. It makes me think of, I think recently I've had this epiphany around um, depersonalizing past pain or any trauma that I've experienced from other people. I'm depersonalizing it. It was nothing personal. Mm. You know, it was just part of my journey. It's just the allotment that I was given to help awaken me. Mm. You know, we, as we get older, we just awaken more and more. And I'm looking forward to continuing um, in this decade. But this depersonalization of, you know, like my dad didn't mean to hurt me. My mom didn't mean to hurt me. My brother never meant to hurt me. You know, A, B, C, and D, they, they weren't trying to hurt me. You know, that's, it's so, if, when you can depersonalize it, I feel like it allows there to be more acceptance of it and the acceptance of the pain then allows it to transform into something else. Mm -hmm. I like the, the quote that everyone is always only ever commenting on their own state of consciousness. So it's like, it doesn't matter if like someone's saying something about you, all they're really doing is commenting on their own state right. of consciousness. And the only difference between all humans is that we're all at, a, at some point point of our stage of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we're all at our, you know, different stages. I know. We'll be like, oh, I'm more evolved or my, my boyfriend needs to catch up. And it's like, we're just going to like roll down the river and then go into the ocean and then evaporate up into the clouds and then go back up to the top of the mountain and just do the whole thing again. So like, there's no real ahead or behind, mm. you know, it's just all like different phases of the water. Mm, that's um, beautiful. Mm, thanks. Again, <laughs> welcome to my head. You're you can just, you, I'll, I'll, I'll leave, um, I'll make bunk beds because I want to leave space for other in, intelligent people to come in. Okay. You can, do you want the top bunk or bottom? Mm, tricky. I think bottom because I pee a lot at night. Great. <laughs> when I was younger, I used to pee the bed and I actually peed on the top bunk and my brother was on the bottom. And did it leak through? I don't remember, but I just, I just know that, you know, I had plastic sheets anyways. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Travis McNichol, <laughs> you're amazing. Where should we send people? Obviously, we want them to watch FUBAR on Netflix. They can see you on you on, where's you? Use on Netflix as well. Netflix as well, okay. Yep, season three okay. of you. Uh, FUBAR drops, well, FUBAR will have already been, uh, been out. Mm -hmm. um, where else can they see me? Yeah, I know you're on Instagram. You have a great Instagram account. I'm on account. Instagram. It's just my name, Travis Van Winkle. Okay. And anywhere else you want to direct people? Do you have a website or we just send them to Instagram? Send them to Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. And if you see me on the street, say, what's up? It's so funny. Sometimes people will see me or they'll stop me and they're like, oh, I didn't know if I should say hi. I'm like, always say hi. I would love to meet you. But like at what point, because like obviously you're going to be like an enormous, even more enormous star. Like, do you think there's going to be like a time where you're like, actually, I rescind that offer? Or do you think like no matter what? Like I've learned a lot from Arnold and I'm not in any way, uh, I don't know what my future is. I just know what right now is. And uh, I really enjoy engaging with um, with anyone that 
stops me that wants to tell me that you know they really enjoyed my work or in some way it had an impact on them. Mm. Uh, but Arnold is someone that he's, he talks to everybody. He's so gracious. Mm. And it's, uh, it's, you know, you have to respect that because he is globally yeah, recognized and known. Famous people in the world yeah. for many decades. Yeah, and I think in celebrity, it just highlights, really amplifies who you already are. Mm-hmm. And he must be just an incredible guy because that's, that's how he shows up. Um, mm. Yeah, say hi. Say hi to me. Okay, great. I'm, I'm going to pack my bags, move into the bunk bed in your brain. <laughs> great. <laughs> Great, I'll save the bottom bunk for you. Oh, great. I'm excited. Well, who's on the top? I don't know. Room room to be surprised. Okay, well, do I get get any say in who gets the top bunk? Or that's just your brain, so you... Okay, we'll make a committee decision. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll sit down and we'll we'll meditate and then we'll decide. Okay, perfect. (laughs) Well, I love you so much. I'm so excited for more adventures. I love you back. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And I'm really excited for this chapter and for you to savor an imprint. And I can't wait to meet your parents. All right, sweet friends, thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful, surprising, emotional version of adventure of why isn't everyone doing this? If you enjoyed it, I would invite you to join us for the VIP after party where these amazing, generous, brilliant guests get to share more of their genius. So that's at zivameditation.com slash why this. And if you enjoyed it, then what if you were to like, you know, follow it or maybe screenshot it and post it on Instagram and tag us at Ziva Meditation and at Travis Van Winkle because that way the tools in here, this eye gazing exercise, this model of what your parents can be in their 40th year of marriage can get out to more people so that more people feel inspired to actually feel their feelings. Like why isn't everyone doing emotional training? This is a question I would love for us to start asking ourselves. So have a beautiful week and I will see you on the next episode.